We are in a really big race against time at the moment. Our native species are at crisis point. They are the animals that give us our identity. We can't afford to be any less ambitious than trying to be predator free by 2050. We'll start with the more easily defendable sites on islands, on peninsulas. We've got 10 large landscape scale projects already underway. Traps front. People are beginning to think about how to do it, not why we can't do it. We're talking eradication, we're not talking control. That jump is massive, in my view, massive. of Raukumara and what has been happening here that finally we have been able to answer those calls. So I am delighted to announce that today the Crown is bringing $34 million over four years to invest in Tapai or Raukumara. In the mill. Feeling overjoyed, you know, like that kind of tiredness after a long marathon. <laughs> Um, and so, really happy. It's been a long road to get us here. This has been a um, three, nearly a four year journey to get to this stage, so it's something to celebrate. So I'm looking forward to that, and then we'll get down to the hard draft of um, planning. I have very high levels of faith and trust in the people that are driving for the restoration of the mana of that forest and they want to hear those birds again and they want to see the Rokumara range as a living, breathing whole again. Many of us, regardless of our walks of life or what's brought us here to New Zealand, Aotearoa, are we intimately connected with our environment. We are now the kaitiaki, if you will, collectively of what I guess our predecessors have handed on to us. We know though that we have become inundated with pests and predators and so the opportunity that we have ahead of us, yeah, it's challenging, but I think it's one that New Zealanders are buying up for the task. Well, I never touched a rat before in my life, um, up until a couple of years ago and my friend Sharia who works at Dock asked me to go along rat trapping to check the coastal traps for all the island. And it just blew my mind. I was so thrilled and excited when I got back. I called these guys um, that day, contacted them, said I want my own rat line. I got 12 traps from my house and then took on a rat line, took on another one a few months later and I'm just away, I love it. It's great. We have lines spread throughout the bush and on those lines, uh, every 50 metres is a, is a trap of some description. There's hundreds and hundreds of traps spread right throughout this whole project area, which is about 210 hectares. There's something about the hunt, <laughs> which I didn't know I had that in me, but you know, my husband's a fisherman, and so he comes home and he talks about where he puts his traps and his catch rate, and now I've got something to talk with him about. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it is good to, to catch those rats. I hate them. I, I actually really, really loathe them. I run, and when I'm running on these trails, I'm literally jumping over rats. It's 
horrible this this season so it's very noticeable everybody's noticed it the trampers and stuff there's just rats just crawling through the bush here and it's it's disturbing says it's been going a long time it started in the early 2000s and you can get a group of people together who don't necessarily know each other that well in the community but then hey they end up on a planting day and all of a sudden they're like-minded and it brings that sense of um, togetherness and a purpose heading towards that goal as well. My name is Bridget Carter, I'm a resident of Stewart Island and I'm lucky enough to be the project manager for um, an amazing concept called Predator Free Rakiura. The thought of being able to participate in conservation at this sort of scale, it's so exciting. If we were able to remove the predators from Rakiura, this would be pretty close to what New Zealand used to be and you can visit it and you can live here and you can live in amongst it and I think that's a pretty amazing goal to try and aspire towards. One of the things that's so amazing coming to live in New Zealand from Australia, from Tasmania like I have, is just this incredible sense of New Zealanders' connection with conservation. And being connected to nature feels like part of every day for New Zealanders. And that's the sort of country I want to live in. That's the kind of place I want my child to grow up in. It's really important that these projects start from the ground up. So much of our connection to this mission is about the place we belong to. And so for communities to feel like they can actively get together and work in service to the species that we all love is really powerful. We're at Tafranui Open Sanctuary. We have a predator-free fence that goes along the narrowest part of the peninsula here. Eventually the plan of course is to have the birds fly over the fence and populate the rest of the local area. When we think about what we're trying to achieve in terms of being predator free by 2050, it seems overwhelming, especially when you look at the incredible amounts of possums, stoats, rats, it's just horrendous. But I think for everybody to go, if, if I can just plant one tree in the back garden, or if I can become a member of an organisation like Tafanui Open Sanctuary. That little contribution becomes part of a much bigger success story. And then it just becomes less overwhelming and it's more achievable. For many, predator free is no longer about the outcome. It's about a social movement of me belonging to a community to achieve an outcome. That's what's been incredibly powerful that we never anticipated. Every few weeks we kind of get together and build a few trap boxes. In a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon you can get maybe 20 or 30 boxes built. We got a grant from the Nico Foundation. The nearby placemakers got on board, they saw the value in, in getting behind the community and helping out, so they gave us um, a couple of pallets of timber that we've been working our way through. So Predator Free Miramar has been running for a bit over two years. We started off with just a handful of maybe 20 traps and backyards that we'd built ourselves and, uh, and then we had an official launch at the local village hall and it's just grown from there. We've now got 1,400 traps out across the whole peninsula. I think what we're doing here in Miramar is hugely important for the, the national vision of the Predator Free New Zealand by 2050. Hi, Cara. Hey. I'm Dan. Hi. How nice are you? Bringing it into the backyards and involving everybody and saying this is something we can all do and we can all make a difference, I think that's crucial. We all know that there's these massive problems. We've got 4,000 at-risk species in New Zealand, but we didn't know how we could deal with that. But by working together as backyards and communities, it gives us the opportunity to participate and it empowers us to take some ownership of the problem instead of leaving it for everybody else to deal with. Friends of Flora started probably about 20 years ago. The group slowly grew and now we're up to about 50 active volunteers. And from starting with one trap line, we now trap almost 10,000 hectares. 
Community conservation has really become the backbone of conservation in New Zealand. I think we need to make sure we support them better and we don't put too much burden on them because we do ask a lot from those volunteers and the volunteers. But I think they also create the social license and the social support for the vision. Keep an eye out for the possum signs, see what's around, start getting a few devices going, record what you're doing. Uh, and with the weather, I think we'll probably be lucky to get three hours in. Well, right, down here, fellas. The big goal is to make the peninsula pest free, but we're starting with what we think is the easiest species, which is the possum. And so far, we've taken over 18,000 off here. Just mayonnaise, a little bit. Eradication, that's the ultimate challenge. We're looking for haystacks now in the landscape, and the haystacks are getting smaller, and then soon we're going to be looking for needles. And finding those needles is going to take a lot of effort. It's easy to sit back and say, oh, no, it's, it's a waste of time, it's going to be too hard. Let's, let's give it a go anyway and, and see how far we get. Because if we don't do that, we'll never know. And we'll uh, extend this line out a bit, eh? If we're going to deliver on our mission of being predator-free 2050, we need to be working not just in the forests, which is what most people think about when they think about predator-free. We need to be working across all of the landscapes. Kia ora everyone. Here we are, about to create the world's first predator-free capital city. So we understand that this has never been done in the world before, right? This is the most complex eradication undertaken, given it's in our capital city. So our vision is to create the world's first predator-free capital city. That's a 10-year vision for us, that's the total length of the project. And we've focused our first eradication phase on the Miramar Peninsula, and that's really our proof of concept. And the country's largest ever effort to eradicate pests from an urban area has begun in Wellington. The $2.4 million project aims to eliminate rats, stoats, weasels and possums from the Miramar Peninsula in Wellington by Christmas. So Miramar's got a few elements going for it. You know, it's a peninsula, so we believe it's easily defendable. How's it going? Just the same place. And of course, there's been this huge community conservation effort going on for a number of years out here through organisations like Predator Free Miramar doing incredible things with the backyard trapping movement. And then beyond that, it enables us to test a whole series of things. So it brings in some complexity. You know, we're talking about an eradication with an international airport in its midst, international film studios, tens of thousands of households, 29,000 residents, businesses, coastal, it's got everything going on. We need to test this as we continue to scale up across the broader city area. Hey there. Hi. Um, my name's Emma, I work for Predator Free Wellington. The city's ready for this, you know, we've tested our social licence, we've talked to Wellingtonians to see if they support this, and that's come back this year at 92% support for eradication. Yeah, just start to check the trap. Yeah, We've got all the permissions we need in terms of 3,000 individual permissions to put our bait stations and traps out. So that's all working in our favour. Any angst is around just delivering it for the city. You know, the city wants this to happen. The broad idea is to have a device of some sort every 50 metres across the whole peninsula. The bait stations are out there to trap rats and the traps are there for mustelids, so stoats, weasels, that sort of thing. We need to make sure that every single animal that could breed will be exposed to one of our devices. We've been using an app called Fulcrum which has all the points plotted already. The green points signify the ones that have been installed and then there's red, blue and orange for ones that we are yet to install. So this is kind of an overview of the peninsula. Basically all our field staff have this app on their phone, so I can sit here and real time see dots changing colour um, as things get put out all over the peninsula. So yeah, it's a great way of keeping track of things. We're gonna do this N7 line and this N6 line, and then um, after break we'll go around and we'll do this coastal line here. We've cut about 70 kilometres of tracks through the forest. 
and that has given us the access to be able to run those networks quite efficiently from a weekly basis for the period of six, seven months. Predator Free 2050, it's super ambitious, but we've got enough eradications, New Zealand's got enough eradications under our belt to have quite a good model to work on. Uh, because it's got such a high urban setting, it's definitely new to us. To get to zero, we have to put every animal at risk. That means we need to put something tasty in front of them that they're going to engage with. So that's a bait station or a trap. Rats have access to other food sources. Someone's dumping food or they come across waste, you know, they come across the remnants of the family picnic down at the beach, they're not gonna go into one of our tunnels. They'll just take the free food and go. And that is a real challenge in the urban environment. You only need to stand on top of the hill and look out across, you know, the 900 odd hectares we've got here and then imagine where the rats could be hiding. You know, I think you'd have your work cut out to get rid of every last one. But when you combine the scientific approach and the dense grid that the eradication is applying, that absolutely will work. And if we can achieve it here and then roll this out across Wellington, there's no reason why it can't be done right across New Zealand. the Doubtful Valley, near the Lewis Pass. Plan is I'll just do a quick signal check for all the birds that we have in this area. And we'll try and get some more with radio transmitters put on if we can catch some tonight. Here are declining, especially on the eastern side of the South Island. Not only people at ski fields and in that sort of front country are reporting you know, where have all the Kia gone? But we are also seem to notice a bit of an increase in predator numbers. We're trying to look at uh, new research now into just how bad this situation is. The difficulty with any work with care is just the, the landscape they live in. They live in incredibly difficult to get to areas, remote areas, and they cover an area of three and a half million hectares, um, and we're only just seeing small snapshots in time of what's happening with those birds. Biodiversity in New Zealand's in, um, in quite serious trouble. I, I think most people can't see what's missing and they don't realise how bad the situation is. If you think of New Zealand as having been this incredibly beautiful, intricate patchwork quilt, what we've got left with now is a few remnants. It might have been a pollinator, it might have been pollinating flowers, it might have been a seed distributor moving the big forests, trees, seeds around the environment. And there's all these roles that these species had that we have either lost or are losing. All the little birds and invertebrates and animals in the forest that had an important ecological role, a service to provide, they're gone. It's like moving into town and ripping out the butcher and the baker and the dressmaker and the school teacher and, and expecting a community to function. That's what mammals have done. So this area that we're in right now is sort of a core breeding area for orange fronted parakeets, so we've intensified the trapping network and also other forms of predator control. So we're hoping that we can keep this as a source population, and even if we lose birds elsewhere in the valley, we can keep sort of reproducing birds in this area. and. Um, Hopefully that will keep them going. We reached a low point probably a few seasons back when we only had less than a dozen wild birds. We've now resorted to these really intensive um, studies to work out what's going on, how many individuals we have in a population, and we can see from one year to the next who's survived and who haven't, basically. Five eggs actually. 
She, she's in the frame there, yeah? Yeah, five eggs. Because the female's likely incubating the eggs, she tends to be on for an hour or so at a time. The male will be off feeding somewhere and he'll come quite regularly, uh, give a call usually, quite a soft call, to indicate that he's here and she'll pop off and he'll feed her close by. Usually when she's in deep incubation, she's only off for a couple of minutes and then she's back on, keeping those eggs nice and toasty. So a few years back, we had uh, a nest in this old tree. Uh, in 2015-16, it was the first nest of the season, and the tree had been tinned, but despite that, the stoat managed to get through some holes in the base of the tree and climbed right up the middle of the tree, straight into the nest. In terms of mainland sites, unless you've got a fence or really intensive predator control, you're always gonna be fighting that battle with them. Yeah. Most of New Zealand's biodiversity, where we aren't intensively managing it, which is most of New Zealand, is going backwards fast. So in the end, the forests go quiet where we're not working. Good night. Little one. You got no transmitter sticking out. You got no bands either. Woo! Well, maybe you're an adult male. See? Is there someone else just hanging out in the bush below? Is there? Yeah. You're calling them, aren't you? Don't fly off. Quite a few roost sites under rocks around here. Uh, also saw a whole bunch of possum poo. Possums come right up to the alpine, to the mountain tops. When I was doing my PhD, I found possum poo everywhere. Um, they can cross right over the main divide and everything. Predator free 2050 goal is a very ambitious goal. I feel we we have a choice. What what is our direction in conservation? Do we? let it all unfold and evolve, some species will die. Either we kill non-native species or we let them kill our native species, it's, it's our choice. So we've also had two focus groups, one here from Ngātupuro, one over on Whānau Apanui who have been engaging with experts in landscape scale pest control. What's been suggested is to start off with around the Mangatūtara in the centre, largely because that's where some of our remaining threatened species are still hanging on. They're just hanging on, but they're hanging on. The Raukumara, we're talking about a 200,000 hectare native estate, there are huge tracts of inaccessible land. Trapping and culling is feasible across some areas, but not all. I've heard um, several leaders in various we that I've said it bring up the issue of TN80 because when you're talking landscape scale pest control, 
1080 is always going to come up, you know, whether it's by those that are opposed to it or those that have taken the time to learn about it. There's been trips into the bush. We've been to predator-free islands. There's been trips to lots of places around the country so people can see firsthand these things. And that's when they, they sort of realise, oh, that Facebook video said one thing, that YouTube video said something else. But now I'm standing here and there's a flock of kaka above me and I got told everything was dead here. And I look around and the place is thriving. So, yeah, reality is the ultimate fact checker. You know, looking out that helicopter window and just seeing it stretch off in, into the distance, they quickly realise that manpower is not going to fix this, so that doesn't leave too many options. Friends of Flora is about trying to restore the biodiversity values of this really special part of Kaharangi. And so we've started with, with the trapping, but it's just a tiny corner of Kaharangi National Park. It's less than 2%. We continually catch stoats. They're continually coming through the area. We're keeping numbers down to a, a sufficiently low level that we can get birds away, but we're still losing a lot of wildlife to stoats all the time. Trapping is not going to do the job on the scale that we need it to. We're losing the battle against introduced predators in New Zealand everywhere where we're not using 1080. To make the Maunga predator free is a huge task. If we consider the use of 1080 here in the broader context of pest control and the scale of the work that we have to do, 1080 is probably one of the only effective tools that we've got in our toolbox. The use of 1080 in a kaitiaki sense is difficult. It is a conflict. At the end of the day, it's a poison. However, most of the conversations I have with the Māori leaders and the projects that we operate in are very pragmatic. And it boils down to, are we going to watch these species disappear or are we going to save them? So kaitiakitanga has a role in caring for and preserving biodiversity. And if that's the best tool at the moment to do it, in fact, it's the only tool we've got to do at scale, then that's what we must do. For us, an operation like this, the Taranaki Maunga project, starts around about six months in advance to a day like today where we're here um, applying the bait. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the planning phases, uh, talk with stakeholders around the operational area, those with water supplies and, and those that have got dogs and, and other issues with stock access and things that we need to be considering. The large helicopter, the Iroquois that we've seen, he's carrying about a thousand kilos of bait, so in that 15 or 20 minute cycle time, he's um, actually delivering bait over about 500 hectares. So treating some really vast, significant areas of high alpine habitat very fast and very efficiently. The cost to treat these areas by ground control to achieve the same objective would just be astronomical and you just, New Zealand can't afford that. 1080 is an excellent tool. Unfortunately, there's a whole lot of hype and misinformation around um, that particular tool. Where we've been able to control predators to protect our wildlife, we're seeing them recover. And I think that's the real story. It's a great tool that will keep us going for a while, but over time, we expect to come up with um, better methods. But environmentally, it's actually a really good choice. One big reason for that is it's highly biodegradable, so it rapidly breaks down in the environment um, as soon as it comes into contact with the soil or whenever um, it gets wet and water flows through it. 1080 hits water, it'll break down to its primary products. The fluoroacetate will break apart to a fluoride and a natural fluoride and a natural sodium and the toxicity is taken right out of it. There's a total of 32 sample points 
Some are private sample points and some are municipal. And on the day, uh, I know where the helicopter's been and I can calculate when to sample each one. We get asked to do 1080 testing quite regularly after an operation, in which case the samples will be sent to us. We'll go through quite a rigorous extraction, clean-up process. They'll be analysed by... At the moment, we're using gas chromatography with um, electron capture detection. The drinking water standards, the Ministry of Health have identified it to be two parts per billion, which is equivalent to three pinheads of 1080 in a football field. Testing takes 24 hours. We didn't find any fluoroacetate. It was down below the detectable limit on all the samples, which means no 1080 detected on any sample. I have seen firsthand incredible benefits after use of 1080 in the environment. We know it's not perfect, and that's why we're investing so heavily in new tools and technologies. But on the other hand, it's by far the best thing we've got available now to make a real difference to our native species by controlling multiple pest species with one toxin, and it can be used over widespread areas. Predator control is a massive part of supporting care not just at a community level with the trapping side of things, but also at a landscape um, scale with aerial 1080. And here are incredibly tricky species and they're one of the few that actually do sometimes pick up the 1080 baits. And so we see that there is a, an urgent need to look at mitigation of those at-risk populations. So where we are here is one of the mitigation sites we used for care prior to our aerial operations. So it's a pretty simple scheme. What we do is we, we shoot a tar and we put it down for the care to find. While we've gathered the care to the site, we put down a bucket of bait that's non-toxic, but it's full of a bird repellent that makes them feel ill. So what we do is we teach them that bait is bad. Then we say the aerial operations and because we've done that training with the birds, we've found that their level of interference with the bait is way down. We radio tagged about 30 birds at the start, and there were about something in the order of 18 that actually were right under the operation. And unfortunately, we did kill two, but we killed no adult females. So some of the older, wiser birds, looks like they've come through fine. And I suppose we're really pleased to report that there's been a lot of fledgling and juvenile care after last season. Our aim is to use 1080 once and then do any mop-up work required to completely remove stoats, rats and possums out of the system. We've just completed the first phase of the operation in Perth, the first aerial phase. We started within the order of 10,000 animals. That's for rats and possums. And what we now believe we have left in the Perth is something less than 50 rats and 50 possums. The other surprise is that after the operation, we cannot find a single stoat left in that landscape. When you're getting into the game of eradication, you need to be confident in your method. That zero means zero. And that's a long way from a not detected, but we kind of know they're still there, to absolute zero. And that's where I think new technologies will come in. Detection is going to be one of the most important things for reaching the predator-free 2050 goal. We have to have something that's there sitting waiting to tell us that those animals are there. And we want to be sitting at our desks or in our office and have that notification come in instantly so we can start a response. What we're finding is that if we use cameras, at about one every 35 hectares, that's sufficient to detect the first family of rats, or the lonely possum, or the stoat that's trying to reinvade that landscape. This is our classic trail cam setup. We've got a um, trail cam here pointing at the base of the motor lure um, with the mayonnaise at the bottom. 
The lure dispenser is the tool that we've developed that probably has had the biggest impact on what we've done to date. All it does is it has a little motor that dispenses a tiny bit of mayonnaise every night. But it means that a trap or a camera remains constantly lured and offers a little snack to any predator that turns up. The rats and possums, once they, once they taste it, and, and the stoats, once they taste it, they're hooked on it and they can't get enough of it. And that's where we pair it with our trail cams. It's a perfect combination. Brings them in and keeps them coming back. Once the cameras had detected a possum, then we dispatched one of our rangers with his possum dog to lay some cages and just work out exactly where they were and remove them. The rats were a bit trickier because we knew that we had a few survivors and the sad thing about rats is that they grow about 50% every month you're not there. The way we're doing it right now is we're targeting every rat with a bait station. The problem is that this is a new thing and it's a little bit like when you're familiar with your home ground and somebody turns up and parks a car in your driveway, instantly you're a little bit suspicious. What's, what's going on? And so the rats tend to avoid the bait stations for quite some time until maybe one of them gets up the courage to go and have a look and take some bait. And if they take some bait and they don't feel sick, then the others will cue off that and think, oh, I must be okay. So we also use a toxin in these that's a really slow acting toxin. So it doesn't affect the animal for quite a few days before they begin to feel sick. So that slow acting toxin helps to build confidence in the population and eventually we wind them down. Although we'd initially completely cleaned out the stoats, we found dispersing juveniles beginning to come back into the block. They're looking for a place that isn't crowded with other stoats where there's food and some territory to occupy. In our best estimate, about 15 crossed the rivers and came into the block. Half of them we've been able to trap, but the other half just seemed to avoid our traps. We knew that in aerial operations, the reason we we're able to remove stoats is because they eat the rats that have eaten the bait. Stoats don't eat the bait directly, they eat the rats that have eaten the bait. So we've developed a technique whereby we pre-poison a rat and place it in front of the camera that the stoat is frequenting. At the moment I'm looking at a stoat who's sniffing around one of our toxic rats. I can see that the rat is gone on the next shot. So that's good news. What we've found only in the last couple of weeks is that six out of seven of the stoats that we've targeted have all died by eating the poison rats. So it's a much more effective technique than trapping. It's very targeted to just one individual at a time. The complete removal of stoats from the mainland is a major for us. It's the thing that does most of the damage to particularly some of the higher order species. But if we can target every juvenile that comes in through this camera and then poisoned rat, then we have a way of continually re-eliminating them. A little bit like COVID, we don't care if the borders leak occasionally, but as long as when they do leak, we can trace them and remove them and get back to zero again. One of the studies that we've been doing is in the eastern South Island, trying to understand those drivers of Kia decline there. So what we've done over the last couple of years is put radio transmitters on a number of adult Kia and we monitor them through time using radio tracking from a fixed wing aircraft every month. What happens is if one of our radio transmitted Kia goes into mortality mode, we go and collect it, send it away for post-mortem and evidence of which predator might have killed that Kia. Kia are the only mountain parrot in the world 
They can cope with their harsh mountain environment and all the challenges that come with it. And their curiosity allows them to forage for all these different foods in the wild. They're omnivorous, so they investigate plants, grubs, everything. The only thing they can't cope with is introduce mammalian predators. I mean these big, big charismatic adult here are getting killed by a range of different things in our forests. Um, especially stoats and uh, and look what they do to them. Imagine, imagine what happens to all the other birds. In the last four months we've had a spate of Kia deaths in the mountains. Seven of these have been confirmed predation events which is quite shocking. Oh. Oh, look what I found. Oh, no. This is a bird, Logan, that we've been tracking for um, a year and three quarters. He's here in pieces. Things I really value about being from this place, our, our trees, our birds, our bats, our frogs, you name it. These things are part of who I am as a New Zealander and they are gravely at risk. And I think it was that sense which really drove the original establishment of this organisation. Everything has its own life force, everything has an essence. Uh, everything has its own modi. So we recognise its modi, we honour, we treasure its modi, and when that modi's out of balance, then obviously our modi is out of balance as well. Bringing and bridging between worldviews to restore nature with people in it is critical for all of us. And I don't think that the whakapapa worldview is unique to Māori. I speak to a number of my friends and colleagues who feel just as connected to place and feel just as connected to the kaitiakitanga paradigm and wish to contribute in a similar form. We have an opportunity to teach each other and to share these worldviews for a better outcome.